Good morning, honors pre-calculus people. Uh, it's me, your favorite math teacher, Mr. O'Rourke, back with another math video. And it's super late. It's the day before class. Sorry. Uh, I've been super busy, and I've been doing a little bit of procrastinating. But here's the video. I promise I'll keep it shorter than previous ones. Um, and uh, I won't talk too much at the beginning here so that the time is lower. Uh, but I'm looking forward to our virtual class tomorrow. So finally, at long last, I know you've been waiting all week for this. Um, we are finally moving on from sequences and series. And we're going to do a quick, just one video lesson here. Um, this is typically day one of three days, but we're going to do a one video lesson here on what are called parametrics. Um, so a metric right, is, is a way that you measure something. Um, and so parametrics, we're going to talk about this, just the basics so that you have an idea of what it is before you arrive at BC Calculus next year, which is where this is going to be something that you're going to use. Uh, so anyway, parametric equations, this is section 7.5 in your textbook. So a plane curve, right, is something on a rectangular grid. And um, when we have y in terms of x or some other kind of equation, that's called a rectangular equation, right? And you know, you can plot values of y with respect to x, so you have to know one to get the other. But sometimes it is helpful to be able to express the position of an object, particularly in physics and other areas of study where we study motion in the sciences. Um, it's particularly useful to be able to express position in terms of horizontal and vertical position independently. And that's what parametric equations allow us to do. We redefine position and motion uh, in terms of two what are called parameters. Okay, we have a horizontal component and a vertical component. And we're going to express them independently of one another, both with respect to a different variable, and that variable is going to be time. Okay, That's our parameter. Now, the parameter could be anything, right? You can have a an equation in terms of whatever variable you want to. It just turns out in most cases, the most useful parameter to use is t for time. Okay, um, And draw it like this, so we don't mess it up with a plus sign, those of you with sloppy handwriting. Um, so again, this is generally going to be time that we're going to use here. So here's two functions. We have x equals f of t and y equals g of t. x is going to express horizontal movement of something with respect to time. And y is going to express vertical movement of something with respect to time. And when you take both of those things in conjunction, you can break down the motion of a an object very nicely, right? Um, you can ex it doesn't have to be rigid either, like, right? Like we did with vectors. It usually describes movement in terms of very rigid horizontal and vertical movements. But when we take these two parameters in conjunction, we can get some really nice smooth curves kind of like when we did with polars. So generally, parametrics are equations are expressed over a specific time interval. Okay, So that's going to look like this. Time is between two things, right, a and b. And uh, it's a great way to express pieces of a function or the limits of a function. Now, again, we haven't talked about limits yet. That's coming next week. Um, so I won't mention it too much here. But anyway, let's get into an example so you can start to visualize how this looks. So here's an example. We have two parameters. Okay, This is our horizontal parameter, x equals t minus 2. So horizontal position of an object, right, left and right, on a coordinate grid. You just need to know the time value you're using to figure out where the object is in terms of its horizontal positioning at that time. And then we have a y equals, and that's our vertical component. And again, this is expressing up and down movement of the object with respect to time. So our time interval here is from negative 5 to 5. Now, this could be seconds. This could be minutes. Sorry, my mother is screaming in the background doing a spa day with her preschoolers. So, you know, maybe they'll make it onto this video in the background. Hopefully you can tone it out, though. So. Um, our input for both of these things, the domain, if you will, is going to be negative 5 to 5, and that's time, right? So each of these position components, horizontal and vertical, depend on what time it is, right? 
So depending on which one you plug it into, we have two different output ranges. There's an output range for X, which is the horizontal position. And there's a vertical. Okay. And when you take these in conjunction to actually plot these on a graph, when you plug in a certain time value for X and Y, let's say we plug in negative five, right? If we plug in negative five for X and negative five for Y, the X and Y values we get create a coordinate point, right? Describing the object's place in time at that moment on a coordinate grid. Um, and then if you get a ton of coordinate points, you can plot an object's movement over time, right? So it kind of allows us to analyze that third dimension of time without having to actually work on a three-dimensional grid, right? Some of you guys know that as like the Z-axis kind of comes out of the page towards you. In order to, let me close my email. In order to kind of analyze time in that respect, we use parametric equations to do that. Okay, so making a table of values for all of those different time values from negative five to five, we can see how the position of this particular object changes over time. So graph table here goes left to right and we get all these coordinate points. So if we take a look at the horizontal position over time, right, which would be this row, it starts at a horizontal position of negative seven and it's getting bigger, strictly getting bigger over time. So it's moving to the right, right, is what that would imply. And then if we look at our vertical position over time, uh, it's also strictly increasing, so it's moving up. Now this could be in a straight line. Uh, it could be a parabolic path of travel, although this would imply it is linear. If we had actually you know, gone over conics this year, which we won't be, um, we could talk about parametrics with respect to conic sections, right? Hyperbolas, ellipses, and the like. Okay. So notice the above table describes coordinates on a standard XY plane like I was just saying a second ago. This suggests that there must be a rectangular equation that also models this same data over time. Um, and here's how we can do it. So again, we have our two parameters um, from before. X equals T minus 2 and y equals 3t plus 4. So the thing about the parameter here is that it's the same parameter in both equations, right? Time is the same whether it's in x or y. So we could solve either one or both equations for t and then do several things with that. So here I've solved both of those above parameters for time. Now you have one of two options here. You could set them equal like I've done here. Uh, and solve for y, or you can solve one of them for t and plug it into the other. Um, whatever you want to do is fine, right? Just do some sort of substitution. But anyway, here we have them equal. Okay, so now we've eliminated that t value, and if we solve for y, we get y equals 3x plus 10. And this is our simplified rectangular equation. So the graph we get from this table up here with all these discrete time values describing coordinate points, that path of travel is described exactly the same way by this rectangular equation. But we also have to specify the domain and range. So domain is the x values, range is the y values. So our domain here is negative seven to three, right? Oops, super zoom by accident, I always do that. Negative seven to three, which was our x output range. And then our actual range of this rectangular equation is negative 11 to 19, which is our y output range, okay? In other words, the min and max of the x values is the domain, the min and max of the y values is the range, okay? And they're the same as that parametric equation for above. So on the next page, we're gonna graph some of these things, but what I want you to keep in mind as we graph this is that parametrics describes movement from an aerial view. And now we're gonna laugh as I try to spell aerial. I think that's how you spell it. In other words, a bird's eye view, right? So we're looking from above 
at the path of travel is how you should envision this when we graph it. Okay. The object's path of travel. So let's get into this. Here's a full example that we are going to now do. And actually, you know what? I could probably go up and show you the graph for this. Yeah. Why don't I do that first before we get into this? Um, let me go ahead and delete this writing here. Erasing the stuff. Okay. Let me make a little graph here. Whoosh. Sound effects necessary. Whoosh. Okie dokes. So X goes from negative seven to three. So ASMR pen clicks. Okay. And then Y goes from negative 11 to 19. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Okay, cool. So there's my very poorly made graph. I probably could have just copy and pasted something. Uh, but if we go ahead and graph this, right, there's a couple ways you could do it. You could graph the rectangular equation that we just found, or you could just graph all these coordinate points. Um, I'm going to be lazy here and just graph the left endpoint and the right endpoint. And then I'm just going to use the fact that I know it's a line, right? This is linear and just connect the dots. So we have negative seven um, on the X value and negative 11 on the Y value. So two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then all the way down here at negative 11. And then we have three comma 19 all the way up there. Okay. And then if I connect the dots, there's our object's path of travel. And typically when we do this with parametrics, we also put some arrows on it to note the path that it's traveling. So the object is starting here on the left and between negative five and five seconds or minutes or whatever it is, it ends up over here, right? And this is a view from above, right? We're looking down on the object and this is its path of travel over time. Okay. So parametrics are super useful to analyze any kind of movement. And it has a lot of relationships to things you learn in physics with kinematics and such. Okay. So let's get into another one. Two parameters. They're both linear. We have X equals two T plus three and Y equals three T plus one. Okay, find the rectangular equation and its domain and range given t is between negative 5 and 2, and we'll graph it. Okay. All right. So first things first, let's find that rectangular equation. There's a couple ways we could do this. We could solve both of these for t, or just solve one of them for t and plug it into the other. Let's just solve one of them. Let's solve both of them for t, actually. So t is equal to x minus 3 over two, and also t is equal to y minus one over three. So if we set those two things equal, we have x minus three over two is equal to y minus one over three. Okay, so multiply this side by three. And let's see, we can multiply this on both sides by, well, I should probably just cross multiply. We're doing it live. So cross multiply both sides. Actually, that's what I was doing. I'm losing my mind. 3x minus 9 is equal to 2y minus 2. Okay, so uh, we'll add 2 to everything. So plus 2 on both sides. So 3x minus 7 is equal to 2y. So we get y is equal to 3 halves x minus 7 halves. Yay! Okay, so there's our rectangular. So this is also describing linear movement over time. And um, I think the next thing we'll do to get the domain and range, um, if it's, if it's going to be a linear function like this, it's actually pretty easy to get the domain and range of x and y. Um, you just plug in the minimum t value for x and y and the maximum for x and y and that ends up being your domain and range but that won't always be the case what i would instead suggest is that you always make a table of values and plug into it 
for all your t's to get your x's and y's and then just pick the lowest and highest from that table so here we go negative five negative four negative three negative two negative one zero one and two okay so if we plug in for x plugging in negative five we get negative seven plugging in negative four we get negative five we're plugging into x here right this guy and then it has a slope of two so if i'm going you know down i'm going to lose two every time so this is minus three minus one or rather add two every time one three five and seven okay and now we'll do the same thing for the y's so we're going to plug in all those t values to the y equals 3t plus 1 negative 14 and then this has a slope of 3 so negative 11 negative 8 negative 5 negative 2 1 4 and 7. okay so from here we can get our domain and range the domain is going to be negative 7 to 7 And the range is going to be negative 14 to 7. Take your lowest and highest values. Okay. So now, last thing to do is just graph this. And it's going to look linear, just like the previous one did. Okay, so negative 7 to 7. And then negative 14 up to 7. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Cool. Let's graph this and uh, finish this one up. Okay. So just graph these coordinates. Again, it's linear. So we can just do the left endpoint and the right endpoint, and we're good. So negative 7, negative 14. That's going to be all the way down here. And then 7, 7 is going to be right about there. Connect the dots. And there's our path of travel. And we'll put our little movement arrows on it so we know where we're starting and where we're ending up. And that's it. Okay. Very, very simple. So let's get into one that's uh, not linear. Okay, so we have x equals t squared minus 2 and y equals 3t plus 1. So the y parameter is still linear, but the x parameter, right, its horizontal position is modeled by a quadratic function in terms of time so the x won't be strictly increasing we'll find it changes find the rectangular equation and its domain and range given t is from negative 3 to 5 and again we're also going to graph okay so first thing maybe we want to make a table this time before we solve so let's start with a table this time you can really do this in whatever order you want to but just so we can get an idea of what's going on here. Let's make that table first and let's make it kind of big. So negative three to five. So t, x, and y. Negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, so plugging into x. If we plug negative three in there, we get nine minus two, which is seven. Now we can't do that little trick from before just using the slope because this is quadratic and it doesn't quite work that way. So we plug these all in, but at some point we're gonna find their symmetry. Plugging negative two in, we get four minus two is two. Uh, let's see, one minus two is negative one. Zero minus two is negative two. And then if I plug in one, they start to repeat themselves, right? There's symmetry. So if I plug in two, again, I'm gonna get two here. Plug in three, we get seven. 16 minus 2 is 14, and 25 minus 2 is 23. So after we hit t equals 0, the values of x started to repeat themselves again. So that must mean that we have probably the vertex there at t equals 0. We'll confirm that in a second. Let's do the y's now. The y is linear, so we can use that little slope trick again. Plug in negative 3, we get negative 9 plus 1 is negative 8. And then we increase by 3 every time. So negative 5, negative 2, 1, 4, 7, 10, 13, 16. Okay. Now, again, like I said, the symmetry started before and after t equals 0. So this right here is going to be our vertex. 
Now let's see if that matches up with what we get for the rectangular equation here. Okay, so let's solve um, for our rectangular. Now this is one of those situations where you don't want to solve each one for t. And the reason for that is if you solve the x parameter for t, you're going to get a square root and you don't want to deal with that. So just solve the y parameter for t and then plug it into the x one. So we get t is equal to y minus 1 over 3. And then we're going to substitute, in, substitute it into the x parameter. So x is equal to y minus 1 over 3 squared minus 2. So we get x plus 2 is equal to y minus 1 squared over 9. And if we multiply both sides by 9 and rearrange this a little bit, we have y minus 1 squared is equal to 9 times x plus 2. Now we didn't do conics yet this year, and we pretty much won't be. This is our rectangular equation. But this is the conic section uh, equation for a parabola. And this is a parabola opening right. Okay. So its vertex, this is vertex form, is at negative 2 comma 1, like we have from this chart here. Okay. So last thing to do before we graph this, we just want to define what our domain and range is for this. Okay. And then we'll, we'll go ahead and graph it. So the domain here, you need to be careful, right? Look for the lowest x value and the highest x value in that column. Lowest x value is negative 2. Highest is 23. So the domain goes from negative 2 to 23. The range, same thing. Lowest x value, or sorry, lowest y value is negative 8. Highest y value is 16. So negative 8 to 16. Okay. Last thing to do is graph this guy. So let's go ahead and give it a shot. So domain, negative 2, and then all the way to 23. Here we go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Man, am I good. Cool. Now for the range. Negative 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then up to 16. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Cool. All right. Let's graph in blue, shall we? So don't just graph the lowest uh, domain and range together and the highest domain and range together. That only really works when you're working with linears. Go back to your table and graph those points. OK, so let's maybe graph, I don't know, let's start at the bottom here, right? So our first point is 7, comma, negative 8. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way down here at negative 8. Okay. Next point is 2, negative 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, right about there. Next point is negative 1, negative 2. And then we get to the vertex of this, negative 2, comma 1. Okay. So I'm a little off here in terms of the scale, but, you know, it is what it is. Oh, that's because I put this one in the entirely wrong place. Negative 1, negative 2. Some of you were probably screaming at the page. We're doing it live, peeps. Okay, now the symmetry begins, right? So negative 1, comma 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay. 2, comma 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Right about there. 7, comma 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And... 3 above that, so right about there. I'm going to skip the 14, 13, because I'm going to fudge that. And then 23, 16, right about there. And this is parabolic when we connect it. If you miss some dots, just make them bigger. So this, remember, is a, an aerial view of an object's path of travel on the ground, right? And this is really kind of how we move as humans. It started down here, and then here's its path of travel. Right, as denoted by arrows. And it keeps on going. Okay. So start and end. Okay. Bird's eye view, an aerial view of an object's path of travel. They're kind of cool, I think, at least. Um, but I am a nerd. So, you know, read into that what you want to. 
Okay, here's one more. Um, pause the video if you'd like to try it on your own. Um, otherwise, I'm going to jump right into it. So here we don't have any quadratics, but we do have a rational function here, which is going to be interesting. Okay. So we have y equals 3t plus 6 over 5 plus 4t. And then our x parameter is linear. Again, we're going to find the rectangular domain and range, and we're going to graph it. OK. So maybe let's start by solving this for t. And then we'll just plug that into y. So this is going to be x minus 2 all over 3. And we're going to plug this into here and into there. Uh, but first, let's do our table of values. So t, x, and y. So our t values go from negative 1 to 5. So negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, I'm not quite sure what this is going to look like yet. Um, but it will be interesting, I promise you that. OK, let's get our x values. It's linear. So if we plug negative 1 into 3t plus 2, we get negative 1. Slope of that line is 3, so we're going to go up by 3 every time. So 2, 5, 8, 11, 14, and 17. And now let's fill out the y1. This one's going to be annoying. We're going to get some fractions here. Okay. So we plug negative 1 into this rational function. And let's see. We get negative 3 plus 6, uh, which is 3 over 5 minus 4, uh, which is 1. So we just get 3 here. Now we plug in 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, right, for time. And here's what we get. We get 6 fifths when we plug in 0. Then we get 1. Then we get 12 over 13. And then we get 15 over 17. And then 18 over 21. And then 21 over 25. And that's approximately 0 0.84 if you check that out in your calculator. Okay. So the y values you can see are getting smaller over time, but not with a standard slope, right? Like with our linear. They're getting smaller, but the rate at which they're getting smaller is decreasing. Okay. So let's write out our Darmanian range. Smallest x value is negative 1, highest is 17. So negative 1 to 17 is the domain. The range, smallest y value, careful here, doesn't happen at t equals negative 1. It's actually flip-flopped. It happens at the highest time value. So our smallest y value is 21 25ths. And the highest is 3. Kind of an interesting little mismatch there. OK, so we've got our domain and range. Last thing to do is get the rectangular equation. So let's go ahead and, and actually do the substitution here. Alrighty. So we have y equals 3 times x minus 2 over 3 plus 6 over 5 plus 4 times x minus 2 over 3. And now we'll go ahead and simplify this. So y is equal to, let's see, that's just going to be x minus 2, those 3's nicely cancel, plus 6 over 5 plus 4 thirds x. Let's see, that's going to be minus 8 thirds there. So this comes out to x plus 4 over 4 thirds x. Let's see, 5 minus 8 thirds, that's going to be plus 7 thirds. OK, multiply the top and bottom by 3 to make this look nice, and we get our rectangular. 3x plus 12 over 4x plus 7. And that, my friends, is our rectangular equation. Okay. Now that's a rational function. So our parametric graph here, when we actually graph this, models the movement of a rational function. Which, if you're thinking this to yourself right now, right, rational functions have vertical asymptotes and horizontal asymptotes. So when we think of movement in terms of that, it's a little bit weird, right? But graphically, that's what makes sense here. There's a vertical asymptote at x equals whatever makes the denominator equal to 0. And that would be negative 7 fourths. OK. 
Okay. And then there's a horizontal asymptote at y is equal to, okay, the degree of the top and bottom are the same, so the ratio of the leading coefficients. So three fourths. Okay. So let's also graph this, and I'm going to need to go down here to do that because I'm going to run out of espacio. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so domain, negative 1 to 17, so negative 1. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Boom, master of spacing and spatial reasoning. Okay, range, 21 25ths up to 3. So 1... Two, three. Definitely not to scale, but oh well. Okie dokes. Let's put a little uh, horizontal asymptote here at three quarters. That's about right there. Okay. So our object's movement is not going to go beneath that. All right. So we have the point negative one comma three, which is right about there. That's where this starts. And then the object is going to move to the right, but also go down. So let's see, 17.84, right about there. So what's going to happen is, and we have another point here, 5 comma 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 comma 1. So we have some kind of good points here. What's going to happen is this object is just coming down, and then it's just moving like this. That's all that means. And it actually does not continue. Made a boo-boo there. Let's try that again. All right, it doesn't continue because this is an object's path of movement. So it starts up there, and then there you go. Okay, So here's where it starts, and here's where it ends. And there you go. Voila. Okay, that's parametrics. It's pretty straightforward, right? Table of values for x and y, rectangular, plot it, domain and range. All right, last thing here. Um, going the other direction. So if I give you the rectangular equation, can you find two parametric equations that model the same path? Now what's cool about this is that there's an infinite number of ways to set this up. Your x parameter could be whatever you want to, and as long as you algebraically make it so, the y parameter changes to make up for whatever you made the x. Okay, So here's what I'm talking about. Here's our rectangular equation, y equals 3x plus 2. So our path of movement is linear. And our domain, right, and remember these are x values. Our domain is negative 6 to 8. Find parametric equations, x of t and y of t, and the restrictions on time. So like I said, there's infinitely many answers here as long as the two parameters accurately model the correct data. So there's easy choices and there's hard choices, right? The easy choice is just to make x of t equal to t, right? Your, your horizontal parameter x is just your time values. So whatever you choose for x to figure out the corresponding y parameter, you just plug t, right, in for x in your rectangular. So substitute into your rectangular and solve for y. Okay. And if we do that, we just replace the x up here with a t, and our y parameter is 3t plus 2. Done, right? Now, the time values are dependent on the x parameter. So, if your x parameter is just equal to t, our time values are the same as our domain. But your second option here is literally anything else, right? That's the easy choice, and if you have options, you should do that every time. But how about if x of t was equal to 4t minus 3? So first thing, y of t would be equal to 3. Substitute x for 4t minus 3. And then we're going to simplify this. So this comes out to 12t minus 9 plus 2. So our corresponding y parameter is y of t equals 12t minus 7. Those two parameters, 4t minus 3 and 12t minus 7, describe the same path of movement as the one above, but it's a little bit more complicated. Okay. Now, our domain of t values here is not negative 6 to 8. Our t values, we need to solve for them based on what our x parameter is. 
Okay, remember the domain was negative six to eight. Those are x values. So to get the t values, we're gonna set them equal to the x parameter and solve for t. So negative six equals four t minus three. So negative three equals four t. So t is equal to negative three fourths. Okay, so there's one t value. And then to get the other t value, eight is equal to four t minus three. 11 is equal to 4t, so t is equal to 11 fourths. So our time restriction here is from negative 3 fourths to 11 fourths. Now your time restriction again is going to change based on what your x parameter is, and you can choose whatever you want to. Again, if you have a choice, just use the easy one, right? But if we were in class and we were doing a quiz, I would probably make you do this. Okay, one more. Pause the video if you'd like to try it on your own. Otherwise, I'm going to go ahead and do it, and then we'll call this video a wrap. Y is a quadratic this time. 2x squared plus 3x plus 1. Domain is negative 5 to 2. Find the parametric equation. So the easy choice is x of t equal to t, and that would mean that y of t is 2t squared plus 3t plus 1. Okay? And the time restriction would be the same as the domain, negative 5 to 2. That's the easy choice. But if we let x of t be 3t plus 1, we have to do a bit more work. Let's use purple for this. So y of t, substitute x equals 3t plus 1 into that original equation. So 2 times 3t plus 1, quantity squared, plus 3 times 3t plus 1, plus one. Math time. So square this out. This is 9t squared plus 6t plus 1 plus 9t plus 3 plus 1. So y of t, if we distribute and simplify, it's going to be 18t squared plus 21t plus 6. And there you go. Okay, there's your y of t. So our domain of x values was negative 5 to 2. But our time values aren't going to be the same because we chose something different for x. Let's just go ahead and set these equal like we did before and solve for t. So negative 5 is equal to 3t plus 1. And 2 is equal to 3t plus 1. So we get negative 6 equals 3t. So t equals negative 2. And then here we get 1 is equal to 3t, so t is equal to a third. So our time restrictions for this one, negative 2 to 1 third. And that's it. And that, my friends, is a video. Sorry it was late. Let me give it the old signature. And there's our brief foray into parametric equations. Okay. If we were in school, we'd be doing a lot more with this. We'd be doing some applications, but unfortunately, we don't have time for that. All right. So for BC Calc next year, this is you know kind of the basics of what you need to know. We do end up going over it a second time, but this will get you a nice base of knowledge. All right. So that's a video. Hope you enjoyed it. Sorry it's late. Um, I will see you in virtual class tomorrow. Please take some notes on this. Try to understand it as best you can, and uh, we'll go over it a bit further. All right. Enjoy, guys. Peace.